Part 1 1. You will hear a woman making a hotel reservation over the phone. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon, Grandview Hotel. Yes, hello. I, um, I'm planning to spend a few days in your city next week, and I'd like to, uh, make a reservation. Of course. When did you want to stay here? Next week. Wednesday night and Thursday night. So, that's February 13th and 14th? Yes, that's right. And how many guests will there be? Just me. So, do you have a room available? Yes, we do. I'll just need to take some of your information. May I have your name, please? Oh, right, yes. It's Roxanne Wilson. W-I-O-N. Thank you, Miss Wilson. And may I have your credit card number? It's 233-618-9872. 9872. Got it. All right, Miss Wilson. I have your reservation confirmed. Can I help you with anything else? Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Well, yes. I was wondering, since I'll have a couple of free hours Friday morning before I leave, is there anything interesting to see, interesting to see close to the hotel? Do you like museums? The art museum's very close by. I love museums, but not art. Can't stand it. I've heard your city has a very interesting science museum, though. Yes, but unfortunately it's closed in the winter. Are you interested in shopping? Sure. I love shopping. Are there any good stores nearby? Yes. We have a large shopping mall just two bus stops away. You take the bus to Monument Square, and it's just half a block from there. Just look for the post office, and you'll see the mall entrance next to it. Fabulous. What about lunch? I hear your city has good restaurants. Yes, there's a nice restaurant very near. It's just across the street from the park. Sounds good. I can have lunch, then walk in the park after... I have one more question. What's the best way to get to the hotel from the airport? Subway is the fastest, of course. There are buses, but they're quite slow. I'll be arriving quite late, after 10 p.m. I thought I might have to take a taxi. The subway runs until midnight. Oh, good. Then I'll do that. Will there be someone at the hotel front desk that late? Oh, yes. The front desk stays open until 2. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear a manager in a company talking to employees about volunteering for charity work. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Thanks for coming, everyone. Okay, so this meeting is for new staff and staff who haven't been involved with our volunteering projects yet. So, basically, the idea is that we allow staff to give up some of their work time to help on various charity projects to benefit the local community. We've been doing this for the last five years, and it's been very successful. Participating doesn't necessarily involve a huge time commitment. The company will pay for eight hours of your time. That can be used over one or two days all at once, or spread over several months throughout the year. There are some staff who enjoy volunteering so much, they also give up their own free time for a couple of hours every week. It's completely up to you. Obviously, many people will have family commitments and aren't as available as other members of staff. Feedback from staff has been overwhelmingly positive. Because they felt they were doing something really useful, nearly everyone agreed that volunteering made them feel more motivated at work. They also liked building relationships with the people in the local community and felt valued by them. One or two people also said it was a good thing to have on their CVs. One particularly successful project last year was the Get Working Project. This was aimed at helping unemployed people in the area get back to work. Our staff were able to help them improve their telephone skills, such as writing down messages and speaking with confidence to potential customers, which they had found quite difficult. This is something many employers look for in job applicants, and something we all do without even thinking about every day at work. We've got an exciting new project starting this year. Up until now, we've mainly focused on projects to do with education and training, and we'll continue with our reading project in schools and our work with local charities. But we've also agreed to help out on a conservation project in Redfern Park. So if any of you fancy being outside and getting your hands dirty, this is the project for you. I also wanted to mention the annual Digital Inclusion Day, which is coming up next month. The aim of this is to help older people keep up with technology. And this year, instead of hosting the event in our own training facility, we're using the ICT suite at Hill College, as it can hold far more people. We've invited over 60 people from the Silver Age Community Center to take part, so we'll need a lot of volunteers to help with this event. If you're interested in taking part, please go to the volunteering section of our website and complete the relevant form. We won't be providing any training for this, but you'll be paired with an experienced volunteer if you've never done it before. By the way, don't forget to tell your manager about any volunteering activities you decide to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20.
the participants on the Digital Inclusion Day really benefited. The majority were in their 70s, though some were younger, and a few were even in their 90s. Quite a few owned both a computer and a mobile phone, but these tended to be outdated models. They generally knew how to do simple things like send texts, but weren't aware of recent developments in mobile phone technology. A few were keen to learn, but most were quite dismissive at first. They couldn't see the point of updating their skills. But that soon changed. The feedback was very positive. The really encouraging thing was that participants all said they felt much more confident about using social media to keep in touch with their grandchildren, who prefer this form of communication to phoning or sending emails. A lot of them also said playing online games would help them make new friends and keep their brains active. They weren't that impressed with being able to order their groceries online, as they liked going out to the shops, but some said it would come in handy if they were ill or the weather was really bad. One thing they asked about was using tablets for things like reading newspapers. Some people had been given tablets as presents, but had never used them. So that's something we'll make sure we include this time. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear a conversation between two students planning a research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 23. We'd better start planning our research project because we don't have much time left before it's due. I know, only three more weeks. Is that all? I thought we had more time than that. Well, let's get to work then. OK, so we agreed we're going to interview shoppers about their spending habits. Did we decide to conduct our interviews at the department store? We haven't decided anything definitely yet, but I think the shopping mall would be a better place. We'd get more of a variety of shoppers there. Yes, that's a good point. So let's do that. How many interviews did the professor say we had to complete? She said at least 30. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Yes, but if we divide it up between the two of us, that's just 15 each. That's not so bad. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. OK, so I guess we'd better start designing our questionnaire. Well, we have to do some reading first, don't we? Didn't we say we were going to compare our results to the results of a government study? Right, the government study about how the economic crisis has changed people's spending habits. We want to see if we get similar results. Yes, so we'd better read that first and then design our questionnaire. Then I guess we'll be ready to go out and interview shoppers. No, don't you remember? The professor said she had to approve our questionnaire first before we actually conducted the interviews. Oh, right. So we'll get her approval and then conduct the interviews. I think it's Saturday would be the best day for the interviews because everyone's out shopping then. 
Right. We'll do it on a Saturday then. And let's also plan to get together the next day to analyse the results. It's best to do that while everything's fresh in our minds. Don't you think? Sure. That sounds like a good idea. Okay, so then we're going to have to present our results to the class. Do you have any ideas for that? It's an important part of our grade, so I think we should plan it well. Well, I think the obvious thing is to prepare some charts showing our results and how they compare with the government study. That will help make the information a lot clearer to the class. Right. Okay, so we'll draw up some charts of the results. And then that's it. All that will be left to do is give the class presentation. Do you think we can be ready on time? I sure hope so. Let's get started now. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about leadership introducing a theory called self-regulatory focus theory. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I want to talk about self-regulatory focus theory and how the actions of leaders can affect the way followers approach different situations. Self-regulatory focus theory is a theory developed by Tory Higgins. He says that a person's focus at any given time is to either approach pleasure or avoid pain. These are two basic motivations that each and every one of us has and cause us to have different kinds of goals. Promotion goals in different life situations emphasize achievement. Prevention goals are oriented towards the avoidance of punishment. In a specific situation, our thoughts might focus more on promotion goals or more on prevention goals. The theory suggests that two factors affect which goals we are focusing on. First, there is a chronic factor. This factor is connected to a person's personality and says that each person has a basic tendency to either focus more on promotion goals or focus more on prevention goals as part of his or her personality. Second, there is a situational factor, which means that the context we are in can make us more likely to focus on one set of goals or the other. For example, we are more likely to be thinking about pleasure and to have promotion goals when we are spending time with a friend. In contrast, if we are working on an important project for our boss, 
we are more likely to try to avoid making mistakes and therefore have more prevention goals in our mind. Research has shown that the goals we are focusing on at a given time affect the way we think. For example, when focusing on promotion goals, people consider their ideal self, their aspirations and gains. They don't think about what they can lose, so they think in a happier mode. They feel more inspired to change. When people are focusing on prevention goals, they think about their ought self. What are they supposed to be? What are people expecting from them? They consider their obligations to others. As a result, they experience more anxiety and try to avoid situations where they could lose. Now that I have talked about the two focuses and how they affect the focus that followers adopt in a specific situation. In talking about leadership, we often mention transformational leaders and transactional leaders. Transformational leaders, when interacting with their followers, focus on their development. In their words and actions, transformational leaders highlight change. Their speech is passionate and conveys a definitive vision. All of these things can encourage followers to think about what could be. In other words, they inspire a promotion focus in their followers. In contrast, transactional leaders focus on developing clear structures that tell their followers exactly what is expected of them. While they do explain the rewards people will get for following orders, they emphasize more how a follower will be punished or that a follower won't get rewarded if his or her behavior doesn't change. In short, they emphasize the consequences of making a mistake. This emphasis will clearly lead followers to focus on avoiding punishment and problems. This is clearly a prevention focus. In conclusion, it is important to understand that one focus is not necessarily better than the other one. For a designer who works in a field where a lot of innovation is needed, a promotion focus is probably better. In contrast, a prevention focus, which causes people to work more cautiously and produce higher quality work, might be very appropriate for a job like a surgeon, for example. The main point of the research, though, is that the actions of leaders can greatly influence whether people approach a situation with more of a promotion focus or more of a prevention focus. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Writing can be a rewarding process. Here are some tips to help you. 1. Read regularly. Exposure to well-written material can improve your understanding of language structure, vocabulary, and style. 2. Practice writing. Write regularly on different topics. The more you practice, the better you'll get. Consider keeping a journal, blogging, or writing essays. 3. Expand your vocabulary. Learn new words and their usage. Use a thesaurus to find synonyms and antonyms to diversify your language. 4. Study grammar. Brush up on grammar rules to avoid common mistakes. Tools like Grammarly can help with real-time corrections. 5. Seek feedback. Share your writing with others and ask for constructive criticism. This can provide valuable insights into areas you need to improve. 6. Edit and revise. Don't be afraid to revise your work. Editing is a crucial part of writing, helping you refine and clarify your ideas. 7. Use writing prompts. These can spark creativity and help you practice writing on various subjects. 8. Learn from others. Analyze the writing style of authors or content creators you admire. Pay attention to their sentence structure, tone, and how they convey their message. 9. Take writing courses. Online courses or workshops can provide structured learning and professional guidance. 10. Stay consistent. Improvement takes time and effort, so be patient and keep practicing.